Hello dear friends, welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. In this video, I am going to discuss an interesting short story, The Last Leaf, written by a famous short story writer, O. Henry. O. Henry was an American short story writer. His stories are known for their surprise endings. His stories reflect his own experiences in Texas and New York and also include plot twists or unexpected changes in the plot. Two of his most famous stories are The Gift of the, the, Gift of the Magi and The Ransom of Red Chief. It tells the story of an old artist who saves the life of a young artist dying of pneumonia by giving her the willpower to live. In the process of saving her, the old artist falls ill and dies. The characters in this story. The first character we find here, John C. John C. is a young artist from California. She lives with you in a studio apartment in Greenwich Village and she has a long dreamed of visiting Italy to paint the Bay of Naples. She falls seriously ill with pneumonia. The another character is Sue. Sue is a young artist from Manny. She is very close to John C. cooking for her, caring for her and financially supporting her in her illness. The next character is here Bahelman. He is an old artist who lives downstairs from Sue and John C. He has been painting for four decades without any commercial success, but still, ho but still hopes to paint what he calls his masterpiece. The last character is here, Doctor. He is a very busy old man with shaggy eyebrows who attends to John C. and Bellman. He diagnoses John C. with mental as well as physical illness. Summary of the story. Sue and John C. are two young artists, sharing a small flat on the third floor of an old house. Once John C. falls very seriously ill in November, she has pneumonia. Soon she gives up hope for survival. The doctor who attends her does not see any positive change in her condition. One day, the doctor tells Sue that John C.'s chance of survival is very limited unless she has something to hope for. She has made up her mind that she is not going to get well. If she loses her hope to live, medicines will do nothing. Sue tries her best to make John C. take interest in things around her. But there is no response from John C. She always lies still on a bed looking at an ivy plant through the window, gradually losing its leaves and has taken, has taken it in her mind that she will die when the last leaf falls. Sue continues to convince John C. that she is foolish to pin her destiny to the survival of the last leaf on the vine. The old ivy leaves have nothing to do with her getting well. The doctor is confident that she will get better. John C. is too depressed to say anything. John C. keeps on counting the remaining leaves on the creeper. One day, Sue informs Beherman an old fellow artist who is the downstairs neighbor about this, he is annoyed that John C. has such little hope. He is aware of her wish to die when the last leaf falls. Behrman comes to their room and finds John C. asleep. Sue draws the curtain together and they go to the next room. She peeps out through the window and sees only one leaf on the creeper which seems to fall any time because it is raining heavily and the icy cold is blowing. Baherman does not say a word. He goes back to his room and decides to do something for John's life. He paints a similar leaf and sticks it on the creeper while John is sleeping. But walking in open during the extreme cold and heavy rain cost his life. He dies of pneumonia. Next morning, after a vicious storm, John C. sees the last remaining leaf still clinging to the creeper. She is filled with hope. She decides that she wants to continue living. She thinks that there must be reason that the leaf has refused to die and it's a sin to want to die. John C. soon recovers from her illness. After some time, Sue informs John C. that Beherman had died of pneumonia, contracted while living, while being out in the wet and cold, painting the last leaf, Behrman had finally painted his long-promised masterpiece, The Leaf, which saved John's life 
sacrificing his own life in the process. The main theme of the story is hope. The author aims to highlight how important it is for a person to have willpower and hope. John C. is provided with new hope when she sees that the leaf that is supposed to decide a fate is not falling. This shows that even a small act can light the lamp of hope in a person's heart. Another main theme of the story is sacrifice. Baherman sacrifices his own life in order to get some hope to John C. He is aware that John C. thinks when the last leaf falls, she will die. So he sacrifices his own life to paint the last masterpiece of his life. The ivy leaf on the tree was painted by him so that John C. could live her life and have hope. Hello dear friends, welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. In this video, we will discuss an interesting short story titled All Creatures Great and Small written by famous short story writer Ruskin Bond. Ruskin Bond was an eminent contemporary Indian writer of British descent. He authored more than 500 short stories, essays, novels, including 64 books for children. He was awarded the Sahitya Academy Award in 1992 in Dehra for his famous work, Arteries Still Grow. He was also awarded the Padma Shri in 1999 and the Padma Bhushan in 2014. Many people have unusual pets because those are far more exciting than the ordinary ones. The story begins with the likes and dislikes of grandmother. Grandmother was tolerant of most birds and animals, but she never liked reptiles. But one day, grandfather bought a young python for six rupees for a snake charmer and it was not welcomed by the grandmother. She fainted at the sight of the python curled around grandfather's throat she insisted that the python must be immediately taken back to the, to the snake charmer. But the grandfather justified that he, he is just a very young fellow and he will soon get used to them. But grandmother keeps telling him that she has no intention of getting used to him. And also he knows well that his cousin called Aunt Mabel was coming to stay with them the next day. And Aunt Mabel will leave them the minutes she comes to know that there's a snake in the house. Hence, grandmother wanted to get rid of the python. The grandfather was afraid that the python may find its way to the poultry house. The, grand the grandmother insisted that he should lock it in the bathroom and go to bazaar and find the snake charmer and return. Now, grandfather had to take the python into the bathroom where he had placed it in a steep-sided in tin tub. But the grandfather was not able to find the snake charmer. When he comes back, he finds that the python had, had escaped from his bathroom through the window which was open. Now they are unable to find the python. Both of them could not find python anywhere. Now Aunt Mabel has arrived at grandfather's house for a three-week and a couple of days visit. Aunt Mabel happens to see the python in the garden and she comes screaming towards the house. She informed to both of them that she saw a snake and the snake was staring at her from the guava tree when she was reaching for a guava. She also told that it was looking at her in a strange way and it was 20 feet long. After this incident, the python began to make a series of appearances often in unexpected places. Aunt Mabel was extremely shocked to see the python under a cushion. She packed her bags and this made grandmother intensify the hunt for the python. Next morning, the narrator again sees the python curled up on the dressing table, gazing at its own reflection in the mirror. A little later, the python was seen again in the garden. Then again it was seen on the dressing table admiring its reflection into the mirror. So the python was least bothered by others' observation as he was fascinated by his own reflection into the mirror. Now the grandfather has understood the weakness of the python and starts planning to catch it. He prepared a large cage with a mirror at one end. In the cage, he had left a juicy chicken and various other delicacies. 
and fitted up the opening with a trap door. By the time Aunt Mabel had left, for a few days nothing happened. Then, as the narrator was leaving for school one morning, he saw the python curled up in the cage. He had eaten everything left out for him, and he was relaxing in front of the mirror with something resembling a smile on his face. So the narrator lowered the trap door gently, but the python took no notice as he was lost in his handsome reflection. Grandfather and the gardener put the cage in the pony trap and made a journey to the other side of the river bed. They left the cage in the jungle with the trap door open, but the python did not come out of the cage. The grandfather did not dare to take the mirror away. It was for the first time he had seen a snake fall in love with its own reflection. In the story, all creatures, great and small, Ruskin Bond highlights the theme of connection, friendship, attachment, power, anger, and preservation. He tells about his grandfather who was fond of animals. He too liked the animals whom his grandfather has kept as pets. The relationship between grandfather and grandmother is also analyzed. The relationship between humans and humans and animals is the main theme of the story. Hello dear friends, welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. In this video, we will discuss the poem Heart of the Tree composed by famous American poet Henry Keller Bunner. Introduction to the poet. Henry Keller Bunner was a poet, novelist and worked as an editor of Puck, the reputed weekly. He was known mainly for the Tower of Babel, his famous work. His works have been praised by many librarians for his technical dexterity, playfulness, and smoothness of finish. In the poem, The Heart of the Tree, the poet throws light on innumerable benefits of the tree. The poet makes a list of all those benefits which can be obtained by planting a large number of trees. In fact, while depicting the benefits of the tree, the poet shows great concern for the welfare of human beings and the earth. He is very, well very well aware of the fact that without trees and forest, there will be only disastrous situation on this earth. Through this poem, the poet encourages all the human beings to plant more and more trees. In this poem, the poet presents a person with a heart who cares for the planet and therefore plants trees. The poet celebrates such men and points out that it is because of the people like them, the world is still alive and progressing. Stanza 1. What does he plant who plants a tree? He plants a friend of sun and sky. He plants a flag of breezes free, the shaft of beauty towering high. He plants a home to heaven and I, for song and mother croon of bird, in hushed and happy twilight heard. The tribal of heaven's harmony, these things he plants, who plants a tree. The poet asks the question, what is a plant who plants a tree? The answer is provided by the poet himself. He says that the person who plants a tree on this earth plants a friend of the sun and the sky. The sun shines down from the heaven and the leaves of the tree absorb the sunlight and take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and produce food by the process of photosynthesis and release oxygen in the, into the air. The roots of the tree absorb nutrients from the soil and the leaves transpire, the water evaporates and forms clouds in the sky which finally falls down as rain. In this manner, the tree is a close friend to both the sun and the sky. The poet says that the man who plants a tree is going to plant a flag which waves freely in the breeze, freely in the, in the air. The tree is a tall shaft of beauty which towers high almost touching the heavens. This towering tree becomes a home near heaven for the mother bird which sings softly for her young ones in the silent happy twilight hours. Her song a pitch, a high-pitched voice seems to emanate from the heavens and adds to the pleasant harmony of the universe. There are some of the things that a man plants when he plants a tree. 
So dear friends, the entire stanza, the entire stanza emphasizes the benefits of the trees in providing overall harmony to the nature, which he compares to the heavenly peace. Here, Bernard ascribes goodness to the act of planting trees. Stanza two, what does he plant who plants a tree? He plants cool shade and tender rain and seed and bud of days to be and ears that fade and flush again. He plants the glory of the plain. He plants the forest heritage, the harvest of a coming age, the joy that unborn eyes shall see. These things he plants who plants a tree. The poet asked the same question to the reader and answered it himself in order to satisfy the curiosity of the reader. He says that when the tree grows up, it provides cool shade to the people. The travelers who travel on food from one place to another place, they take shelter under the tree. The animals are also seen sitting under its cool shade. It also causes the rain as it is scientifically proven that more trees bring more showers. Moisture from the leaves evaporates into the sky and then falls down the earth as a gentle rain. The man who plants a tree, he plants the seeds and birds of the future. The tree will live for many years. Due to the seasonable, seasonal cycle, its leaves may fall and then grow again. But one day, when it grows old, it will wither away and then it will be replaced by the new trees. The planting of trees creates the sprouting of undergrowth and thus glorious grassy plain takes place where the cattle can graze. The planting of trees creates a forest heritage which will be inherited by many generations of the future. It also creates a harvest of, it also creates a harvest of the future as the tree will bear birds, leaves, flowers, fruits, wood, and other necessary and beneficial things for many generations to come. Thus, the man who plants a tree is going to plant joy that people not yet born will see. So these are some of the things that the person plants while planting a tree. Stranger 3. What does he plant who plants a tree? He plants in sap and leaf and wood, in love of home and loyalty, and far cast thought of civic good, his blessings on the neighborhood, who in the hall of his hand holds all the growth of all our land, a nation's growth from sea to sea, stirs in his heart who plants a tree. The poet once again puts the same question and answers himself. He says that when a tree is planted, it produces sap, which is the vital juice that circulates throughout the tree. It also produces leaves and wood. Thus, the man who plants a tree, he does so because he loves his home and he is loyal to the world he lives in. With immense foresight, he thinks of the civic good of others and he showers his blessings on his entire neighborhood when he is planting a tree. That man who plants a tree, he holds in the hollow of his hands the growth of the entire land. He is responsible for the growth of nation from one sea to other sea. And it is this thought that stirs in his heart, in the heart of the man who plants a tree. Dear friends, these lines depict ecological, social and economical benefits of planting a tree. The poem Heart of the Tree comprises three stanzas of nine lines each. The rhyming pattern of those three stanzas is quite slightly uneven. It can be indicated as A, B, A, B, B, C, C, A, A. The poem begins with a refrain, what does he plant who plants a tree? This question is repeated at the, each, uh, at the beginning of each stanza, highlighting the thought that how beneficial it is to plant a tree. In the first stanza, the poet explains that one who plants a tree plants a friend of the sun and the sky, flag of free breezes and home to countless birds whose song we hear in the twilight that denotes heaven's harmony. In the second stanza, the poet emphasizes that he plants shade and rain, 
seeds and birds of tomorrow which would raise the glory of the earth in plains and strengthen the forest to benefit generations ahead in the third stanza he concludes one who plants a tree germinates the far cast thought that would bring blessings resulting in the growth of the nation hence the poem discusses the usefulness of a tree elaborating on how a tree that is planted benefits not only the nature and nation but also contributes to the growth of human kind one who plants a tree aspires for his nation's growth trees stand straight and steady giving an impression as if they are touching the sun in the sky they sway with the breeze and beautify the surrounding they are home to many birds which sing sweetly and display heaven's harmony on this earth trees give us shade and bring rain they pave a way for many more seeds to grow and birds to bloom in the future trees contribute to the forest wealth of a nation and they ensure plenty of harvest in the days to come the one who plants a tree has a noble thought of a common good that would be a boon for men in general and the na- and the nation in particular he has a dream of the growth of all his land when he plants a tree so dear friends this poem teaches us that we exist because of nature so let's save this mother nature this mother earth thank you so much for watching this video please do click on the like button share the video subscribe the channel keep watching mukesh english thank you so much once again hello dear friends before i begin this video i would like to ask a few questions it's rarely heard that daughter is given equal share in property as sons by a father even with the recent changes in law is property being distributed among daughters and sons equally do you feel there are gender issues in the way son and daughter are served at the dinner table let's try to experience such questions by analyzing a story which is based on gender discrimination or gender inequality welcome to my youtube channel mukesh english in this video we are going to discuss an interesting story based on the theme of gender inequality titled daughter by a famous prolific writer from mumbai lata jagtiani deepa's father who was 78 after long illness he died all the family members assembled at soharab sahib's office at oval to read his will except all the other family members deepa got shocked because the will was and to deepa my daughter who is 26 i leave the sum of 7 lakhs which is already nominated to her in the form of reserve bank of india bonds the rest of the estate as i have already outlined must be divided equally among my four sons after the reading of the will at soharab sahib's office except deepa all her brothers were not surprised as the will was according to what they expected they were in good spirits as the will was in the favor cash property assets office cars jewelry farmhouse paintings all were equally divided among the four sons her father had given everything to his four sons and deepa was left only with 7 lakh rupees all the brothers seemed to be happy with the will as it was exactly as per the expectations the eldest brother reacted normally and before going out of the lawyer's office he even asked deepa whether she was coming the other three brothers quickly pushed the chairs back and stood up and thanked the lawyer and left the office as if nothing was happened the very fact that the brothers did not show any reaction to the will was just like the father they also had the mindset of patriarchy where men had all the power and social privilege and control over property after the announcement of the will Deepa was sitting quietly facing the window and was watching attentively the one day cricket match which was being played in the opposite maidan of the lawyer's house so that she could hide and divert her pain there was a strange unusual stillness about her 
she knew there was no use of crying her father had not given her a fair share for her in his property just because she was a daughter he had followed the male domination system and had given all his property to his four sons when deepa found that the batsman was not out of the crease yet the umpire raised his finger and had made him out she asked sorap about it then sorap told her that the poor batsman must go with the umpire's verdict even if it's unfair as sorap knew what was going through her mind sora was indirectly pointing out to deepa's present situation as he knew that her father had not done his will fairly for his daughter when her eyes met his he could see no tears no tension no worries and no sorrows there was only an empty and airless space where light and joy had once lived she reminded him of a dredged lake he had once seen motionless and vacant it was as if somebody else was sitting upright watching the cricket match the cricket match was a way of escape for deepa to keep her mind away from the pain and humiliation she was having inside her after hearing the will deepa had graduated in commerce and her percentage had been higher than her four brothers even then every time when she asked her father for joining his business he always used to ignore her her qualification did not qualify her deepa was never considered by her father for running his business from the very beginning she had studied further and completed her post graduate degree and later she did diploma in marketing still it didn't make any difference to her father as he had a male dominating mindset once the sohrab sahib the lawyer met deepa's father suresh and he asked him for giving so less to his daughter deepa's father suresh replied in, in an irritation he said what's wrong with the will as deepa had a job at the travel agency that's paying her 10000 rupees a month along with an expense account she won't need more than this that was a reply of deepa's father suresh Deepa's father who followed the patriarchal system did not have any doubts about the way he decided to put the will he concludes that she won't need more than that so the brothers who had grown up in such a male dominating environment would naturally have the same mindset and so they didn't find anything odd or unnatural with the father's will as they also believed in male dominating mindset hence Gender inequality is clearly evident from a father's will where men have been claiming all privileges and powers and had the attitude that women are inferior to them thus the author brings out the picture of the patriarchal system which is still followed in many families thus the story daughter is about the discrimination and inequality faced by daughters in the indian society Although being the eldest among the five children Deepa the protagonist of the story faces injustice and discrimination by her own father her father distributed his property among four sons and one daughter where Deepa the only daughter gets only 7 lakh rupees even though Deepa took care of her father when he was ill she did not get the deserved inheritance hence the story questions the patriarchal system the patriarchal society and shows the hardships faced by a female child so what do we learn from this story the story teaches us that there should not be any gender inequality the female child should be given equal importance as the male child is given either either it's about the property distribution or the education hello dear friends Welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. In this video we will go through an inspiring story of a girl titled My Teacher by Helen Keller. This is a story of this girl's meeting with the teacher who would change her life. It's a beautiful story of a, how a little 7 year old girl grew determined to accept herself and navigate her life later. <clears throat> Helen Keller was an American author, political activist and lecturer 
she was the first deaf blind person to earn a bachelor of arts degree she was born in alabama on 27 june 1880 her father arthur h keller he was the editor for the north alabamian and he had fought during the american civil war in 1882 she was 19 months old and she was stricken by an illness that left her blind and deaf in 1886 according to the advice of an ent specialist her parents contacted alexander graham bell who was working with deaf children at that time bell advised them to contact perkinsons institute for the blind the director of the institute asked former student and sullivan to become helen keller's instructor that was the beginning of a 49 year old relationship with a teacher and sullivan came to her house on 3rd march 1887 and helped her make tremendous progress with her ability to communicate the present excerpt my teacher is taken from helen keller's autobiography the story of my life It's an inspiring story of a person who discovered the world through her fingertips with the help of a great and dedicated teacher. This remarkable story of teacher Anne Sullivan and her student Helen Keller has been told throughout generations. One cannot mention one name without thinking of the other since the two lived and worked together for decades until Sullivan's death in 1936 Helen Keller recalls the afternoon of the 3rd March 1887 as the most important day of her whole life it was the afternoon of this eventful day that a teacher Anne Mansfield Sullivan arrived this was 3 months before she turned 7 years before her education Helen was filled with anger and bitterness she compared herself with a ship stuck in a dense fog surrounded with white darkness and without any compass or guide being blind and deaf she took a toll on her and she desperately needed someone to guide her out of her misery just then ann sullivan arrived as a savior the morning after ann sullivan arrived She gave Helen a doll sent by the blind children at Perkinson's institution. Until later, Helen was unaware that Laura had dressed it. While Helen played with the doll, Miss Sullivan slowly spelled the word doll, D O L L, onto her hand. An interested Helen imitated the spelling game and on succeeding she was filled with the joy and pride until then helen was oblivious to the existence of spellings and words she slowly learned to spell many words and finally unraveled the fact that everything had a name helen was new to the spelling and learning names and words would often get muddled and she failed to distinguish between two different objects she shares an example where she mistook water and mug to be the same once when her teacher tried to make helen understand this her impatience got the best of her she threw her doll her doll on the floor resulting in it breaking she felt no sorrow or regret for her passionate outburst following this incident ann sullivan took helen to the well house someone was drawing water and sullivan placed helen's hand under the under the spout as one hand felt the cool stream and sullivan spelled the word water w a t e r on the other hand it was at this moment that helen suddenly felt like she found a missing piece in a puzzle she at last understood that water meant the wonderful cool something that was flowing over her hand
This discovery awakened Helen's soul. It gave her light and hope that she had always yearned for and set her free. She left the well house with a new determination and eagerness to learn. Everything had a name and each name gave birth to a new thought. When she returned home, every object that she touched seemed to come alive. This was a result of her renewed perception. When she remembered the doll she had broken, she picked up the pieces and tried to put them together, but her eyes turned teary. She realized her mistake and for the first time she felt repentance and sorrow. Helen learned many new words that day. Among them were mother, father, sister and teacher. She felt like she had attained some magical powers. That day she was the happiest child and as she lay in the as she lay in her grip for the first time in forever she longed for a new day to come the story of helen keller is immensely inspiring it teaches one to be patient and brave regardless of her condition helen keller never gave up instead she fiercely stood up and learned to live life to the fullest we often get disheartened at the smallest inconvenience this story teaches us to adapt and improvise helen was not born this way but a childhood illness turned her blind and deaf rather than wasting her time in darkness she gained knowledge and decided to advocate it and sullivan also excelled in a role as a guide and teacher she understood that helen required special assistance and she was patient with her throughout their entire journey one must attempt to always spread knowledge and positivity because they are the things that do not diminish even after sharing dear friends thank you so much for watching this video you can reach me at mukeshenglish at the rate of gmail.com please do subscribe the channel click on the like button for more videos on literature workbook pronunciation grammar communication skills presentation skills interview skills stay in tune with mukesh english thank you once again